Ladies and gentlemen, we are live from the Isle of Man in the UK. This is John and Mike's MMA Corner. Gary, thank you very much for coming back on, speaking with us again. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you back. Uh, we're looking to talk then about some of the kind of poignant moments in your MMA career, uh, I, like I said, you're one of the pioneers of the sport. You, you competed in the UFC and Pride, the two kind of mainstay organisations. When when the sport got global, the sport goes global. You got the US uh, in the US, you had UFC in Japan or Asia, like you say, you had Pride. You had the you, had the, you, you were one of the guys who transferred over on both sides. So I want to first talk about how and why you competed in the UFC you know your fight against Paul Herrera how how did that come about why did that come about and, and what was it about the UFC that made you want to go in and test yourself you know what um, I was um, I was working at Honda Canada Manufacturing a car and automobile um, um, factory and uh, you know a couple of my friends brought me to see uh, UFC I think we I watched it and I just thought it was just ridiculous. And before the end of the tape, um, they're calling the numbers to, for the product. And uh, they're calling the numbers. They don't want to. They don't want to buy product. They want to because somebody that wants to get in, which was me. I didn't want to get out of the point at that time, but uh, they, they uh, were pushing me. Just probably pushing to do things, you know. So it was just really bravado. That's yeah, pretty much much mach, like macho thing, yeah. That's that's pretty much how yeah. men are. That's that's what we are. We have that kind of that kind of. Uh, is a, if there's a challenge, you know, we just always say we'll do it and we'll have a go. The the when when it came to the event itself, you know, look, we're going back to what 16th of February 1996. It was, and you're going against Paul Herrera. You're stepping in for this bout what was at the time before you went in there because when you're backstage you're warming up what was it for you what was it like backstage for you the atmosphere how were you feeling were you just everything oh, was, man, that was you know what the atmosphere was great I was feeling great I just uh, I just I had a, I just, I had a very easy time as a matter of fact just, I had to empty my brain like take everything all the guilt all the worry all the you know, the things that are going on in your life, I had to take everything out of my brain and put it in, um, and put it in hold. So the, really, I was just emptying my brain and getting my nerves to calm down, and, and just I spent a lot of time just relaxing, just going over my brain. Uh, what the fight, how the fight was going to happen, what was going on. And, um, you know, I, I, I knew what was going on. I had, to, I had a great idea of I was actually speaking with Big John McCarthy, and he was saying we, we were talking about um, talking about, say, about the kind of early days with the refereeing and how it, it, we said certain fights kind of brought in moments for him which helped him really develop as a referee. And he said this was what well, I pointed this moment, this this fight out itself, and he said, yeah, that was one of the moments for him where he used to preempt how a fight would go down. He was saying that Paul Herrera had this wrestling background. He expected uh, if the if the fight stayed standing, he thought, you know, you'd have the better um, exchanges on the feet. If it went to the ground with his wrestling pedigree, he thought, you know, you'd have the tougher time. But he so he preempted what was going to happen with the takedown and was out was off set so to speak for where the elbow started landing and he blames himself saying, I preempted when I should have just reacted rather than and you know, it, it was one of their moments for even Gary. You know, it was a, a sorry for a Big John. It was something that he didn't expect to happen. The crucifix position is this. Was that something you had drilled before, prior to that yes. fight? I worked specifically on that for that person. Um, I saw Paul, my my camp. Saw Paul going over the um, a fireman's carry. Hmm. Um, so that's how that's how he was gonna start to start his match. We just saw him working on this particular move over and over and over again. So my my, my corner said, that's what he's going to do. He's going to try to give you a fireman's carry. And now we're going to capitalize on that. So we just worked on that. How to capitalize on his one move. Because he kept on doing it, doing it, doing it all in front of the camera. That's what he's going to do. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. Oh, it was just the fireman's carry that, that, that stood out that he was going to do. 
so one of the things that was interesting then with the couple of fights that you had you had the the ones that stood out obviously were the, the bouts with Don Fry you had the, you kind of had that trilogy with Don uh, and to begin with you know the the it was more the the exhaustion you know you were just physically tired you know the tournament kind of set up it it would it only bode well if maybe you got in there got rid of your opponent quick but if you were in there for an extended period of time, it would actually take a lot of, it would take a very big toll on your body. Was that one of the biggest surprises for you back then? The conditioning that you required, because because you were you're not small, Gary. You're not like a hundred and twenty five pounder. You're a big guy. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was very uh, that, that was a big thing because I, I didn't realize that I needed to have cardio. Well, I knew I needed to be strong. I knew I needed to react. I knew I needed to be stay uh, fast, but I, I didn't, uh, we didn't work on cardio at all because we, I, I didn't think I had any cardio. So, when you went to Japan, and I went to the 10 minute first rounds, that must have been a bit of a surprise for you then, because obviously, I, I know with the UFC they didn't have, you know, set rounds to start with, but with the, when Pride had the kind of 10 minute round and the 5 minute rounds, did that maybe help at all, did you find? I spoke to a couple of people because you, you've, like, for example, you've competed against like the likes of Don Fry, Mark Coleman, just to name a couple of the kind of legends, so to speak, uh, the kind of pioneers like yourself. What was the relationships like with the fighters? Because there wasn't always, like, for example, these days in in MMA, there's always an event on somewhere in the world. You know, even the UFC has an event on nearly every other week. So, but back then, there wasn't a lot of shows on, so there wasn't, you know, a huge pool of fighters. Did you end up cross-training with each other? Did you end up, like, building relationships with fighters over that period of time? Actually, in Pride, what happened in Pride is that uh, when, I, when I fought in Pride, uh, we, you know, we all ate, everybody went out and eat, eat together, we all had lunch, we all had lunch, we worked out, we, everything was together, they all made it all together, um, so it was easy. Everybody was having lunch at the same time, and we went, we all went out for lunch together in a restaurant, we all went out for a tea, that's how it was in Japan, but, um, yeah, the only time you were separate is when you trained, when you trained by yourself, everything else you did together. But did that maybe make it easier then, when you fought each other, because there was a, a slight, you know, it kind of took away the animosity side of things and it was more of a, like the kind of mutual re respect for each other. You went, look, I like you, you like me, we get on, let's just fight. It's, you know, it's a fight game, that's what we're in here for. And when it's done, we'll go out for dinner after. Yeah, because I really did. The government and the animosity was great. I had a great time. It was a lot of fun. What was, what was it like, though, with Pride? Because obviously, it was. let's be honest, completely different than the UFC, you know, you could even, like, I loved, uh, Baz, Baz Rutten would do the kind of intros, the funny kind of segments, and it just worked for Pride, and, and it was a little bit different, you know, and, you know, it, and even Bas Rutten was, I remember Bas Rutten saying he, they used to, you know, he used to eat the fighters and stuff like that, and uh, for you, what was it, what was it like when you went over to Japan, because they took you in, you know, there was a lot of, uh, a, lo a lot of love for you there. For you, did you feel like it was almost like a second home? Yes, it definitely was my second home. I love Japan. Um, I'm an adopted, I'm still even, you know, I love being over there. I love being in Japan, uh, Japan you know. It's been a long time since I've been back, but uh, I want to go back, yeah. I love the place. I was going to say, because you could see the, i tell you what now, when you had that third fight with Don, and I'll say I'll say right now, that was one hell of a beautiful head kick, beautiful technique there, Gary. Honestly, it was so well executed. You know, from the low kicks to set up the high kick, the speech after. Well, even now, like even if I watch it now, it's still a bit you know, touch it. You know, it makes your eyes well up a bit. 
What made you want to come back, though? What made me want to what? What made you want to come back after that Don Don Fry fight? You know what? I I really didn't. I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to leave to begin with. I was forced to leave because uh, my daughter's mother was trying to just. She was uh, jumping on, um, trying to rake me over the coals, and uh, she wanted uh, too much money. Um, um, I was having problems with my, um, with my daughter's mother uh, for money, um, for child support and stuff. So I just I decided to walk away from the game. And then uh, when she realized I was walking away from the game, oh, no, 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 no. Go back to fighting. It's okay. We'll work it out. <laughs> So when you when you came yeah. when you came back, obviously you fought for a while after that. The the game, the the sport itself, just kept changing the whole time. You know, from when you first started to when you finished, the game itself, the sport had pretty much went from obscurity to mainstream. When you were fighting. How much of a difference did you notice in the fighters, the guys you were competing against? You know the the difference in the techniques and training that you people were having. Oh, uh, uh, there was a huge difference. Um, every any time they walk away from the game for just a split second, and you go back, uh, everything changes. Like the whole game was changing. It didn't uh, understand where 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 we we're going. I didn't even know that how it was going to be a sport. Um, I just thought it was just a one-time thing or, you know, I was just going to be around for a little bit. But now it's, uh, it's turned into just uh, your, your your main sport. Boxing is gone. This is, uh, this is what it is now. I'm so happy that it came there. I was going to say, looking back now, are you happy that you, you were part of it? You know, it must be quite a, a warming feeling knowing that you were involved in the sport and to be fair like I said you were one of the names that will stick around in 50 years time yeah I, I, I love it I love it do you look then at the, do you even watch the you know your fights from you know Pride and, and, and the UFC these days or are you quite are you a bit of a fanboy now do you watch like MMA in general just, in, just enjoying the sport yes I'm a fan. I love it. So I love it. I, I love the sport. I can, um, fights can't go on without me watching. The only thing that I didn't like, I, I didn't like that the, the last Bellator card because uh, you know, well, the reason why anybody didn't like it. But uh, you know, I, I, it's hard for me not to watch, not to watch a fight. Yeah, I, I was gonna say yeah, there is moments like that that sadly it's still gonna, it's still happening, but it shouldn't happen because, for example. You wouldn't get back in yourself, and I don't see the point in some guys getting back in. Like Dan Severn said, he would only get back in if it was to face uh, Ken Shamrock, Royce Gracie, and I forget who the third one is now. And I, f- and I remember him saying a third person. And you think D- 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 Dan Severn doesn't need to, you know? You know, he only retired a couple of years ago. Anyway, that's the crazy thing about Dan. Yeah, hard to believe. Yeah, He's some people. Doing- yeah, he's a very, very smart fighter because he, 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 he created a, a technique that would give him longevity in a sport that really shouldn't give you longevity. So look, let's let's go back to uh, just maybe we'll, we'll just look back at one more fight. The kind of uh, well, well, I say one more fight for you. It maybe then instead, is there any particular fights for you that stood out that were kind of ones that you look back on more favourable that just maybe touched you in a different way for different reasons? Um, talking about MMA, I love the fight with me and um, me and uh, what's Sylvester Tarque, I really like that fight simply because that was a fight that was supposed to go one way, and it went it totally went the uh, exact opposite. Uh, at the time, Sylvester Tarque was um, he was uh, like six foot six. He was a wrestler. 
at 343 pounds. He was just supposed to, they hired him to, to beat me up, to put me in my place. And uh, I really thought he was going to beat me up, but uh, just before that fight, he had knocked somebody out, a little person. He knocked out a little person, so he thought he could uh, stand up with, with, uh, with me. So instead of going to his, uh, his uh, physical attributes and what he knows, he decided to stand up and uh, trade with me. I couldn't believe it. I thought I was going to go down in the first, uh, you know, five, you know, two, one, two, three, or five seconds. And uh, he's standing up and I uh, end up uh, getting knocked out real quick. I was just curious, your K1 background, you know, it, it's one of them things maybe people just didn't pay enough attention to. They probably looked over that, didn't they? He, well, he certainly did, anyhow. Yeah. Uh, and that was one of the things, Gary, you, you had that kind of K1 fight as well under your belt, and that, that was what people quite, you know, you had that power. You, you were a guy who could hit hard, you could bang. Like if people stood with you, they were in going to have a lot of troubles. Like you said at the start of your career, the conditioning was a surprise. Was that then something you made an, a conservative effort to to work on to maybe just get your conditioning up a bit further as you you know as you progressed on through your career? Yeah, that's all I did. Just needed to have the cardio, and then I could do it. All I needed was the cardio. Because that, that was going to say, because people don't realise, you know, well, obviously back then, you just, people just didn't realise the, the importance of cardio. It was huge, but they, you know, it wasn't the, the strength and conditioning, so to speak, and everything. People just didn't know what was going on. Uh, was there any other fights apart from that one then that maybe, you know, stick stick in your mind as kind of memorable ones? Obviously, you fought, like I said, absolute legends in the game. You know, when I, when I fought, I fought, I fought, I fought you remember this guy? He was from um, Brazil. Guabe Fatosa. I fought him in. Um, I fought him in K under the K1 rules. Um, stand in uh, stand and bang. Guabe Fatosa was an, an amazing. He was just an amazing arm wrestler. Sorry, an amazing um, kickboxer. And oh my God, this guy! My I was I was in tears after the match. I, I lost the match, but it was um, the most. One of the most memorable matches I've ever had, simply because I took everything he had, and oh my God, I paid for it every time. I, I came under that that uh, that fight, um, and basically in tears. I was so I was so sore. I didn't know what to do with my legs. I put them on ice. I was uh I I went from a, from a little child that in that fight to a full grown man. Guys have said that before with fights where it's it changed them. They realized their mental strength. You know, they realized how much they can actually push themselves. Because sometimes, do you feel that when you had that fight, you realized how much potential there was in you to go, how far you could go with yourself? No, well, that's just it. I realized how far I could go. I realized how much I could take. And man, let me tell you, man, I, I took a lot of fight because he just kicked and kicked. I, that's when I started, after that fight is when I, re I first started respecting leg kicks. Because <laughs> this guy just knocked the piss out of my legs. Uh, if people, if they, don't, if they don't respect leg kicks, yeah, it's something that will certainly uh, open your eyes. I, I suppose Pedro Hizzo was uh, a, a man who definitely... Uh, kind of would use his leg kicks as a weapon as well. Yeah. Like, yeah, he's a, he's a vicious man with the leg kicks. He's a legend for my, in my eyes for leg kicks. He's one of the guys who yeah. you know, showed how effective it was in a fight. You know, he could use that one weapon to literally neutralize an opponent. And that's the thing. There's, there's some guys that use their weapons to their best advantage, and there's guys that you were smart enough to know that other fighters weren't knowing certain aspects of the sport yet and how because back then people didn't think a leg kick did anything but let's be honest Gary you and I know a leg kick if it lands properly it's like someone getting a baseball bat and going full throttle on your yeah, leg, side of the leg yes. yeah it's the worst what I, say is I, say, I say a baseball bat um, is, a, is, is, is great but if I get a 2 by 4 turn to the side yes and it on the edge that's what it's like Oh, it's it's horrendous. I, I honestly, when I get caught with a leg kick good, 
I know I'm going to be walking funny for the next couple of days. There's nothing you can do about it. It's the worst feeling. And it's... Yes, that the leg kicks on, you know, and when, I, when I'm sparring, I'm just sitting there thinking, just one of the big things is, leg kicks I don't want to get caught with, hitting the solar plexus, because that's just, that's just rubbish, let's be honest. No one likes to get, and the liver shot as well. You know, as long as I'm not sparring with Bass Rooting, I should be okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, look, yes, he likes the liver. It, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he does. And he, every time someone gets hit in the liver in a fight, I always imagine Bass Rooting's voice. The li- <laughs> and I hear it. Uh, for, for you, Gary, though, you know, like I said, MMA it's it's been a it's been a huge part of your life. You didn't expect it to, to be like that, I suppose, at the start. Nowadays. How is in like MMA still involved? How are you MMA in, still involved with it? Sorry, how's it part of you still? What what is it you're doing? What is it that you know? Why is it you won't let it go? It's just because of the sheer love of what it actually is. Yeah, I just love what I did. Um, where now what I do? I'm teaching. I teach people how to how to fight. I teach people how to be the be the best they want to be at whatever they want to do. And, you know, everybody's into the fighting game, so I teach it. I teach people how to fight against MMA people, how to use their, their physical attributes to beat these people. And that's beautiful that you're still doing that, you know. And I, I'd love to, honestly, one day I'm going to get my backside over and have an arm wrestle with you, and I'll give you a chance. No problem. Well, you know, I'm, I give seminars. I do seminars all over the place about, about fighting uh, and it could be about our Muslims, too. It's just about seminars. <laughs> uh, look, Gary, you are, like I said before, one of the guy, uh, one of the pioneers. That, especially for me and Mike, we when we talk, we love looking back at the sport when it started off, and and you know some of the guys that went through the game and who have changed it. And your name pops up, and I, I, you know it, it still does now, and it will in the future. Gary, before. You know, you're doing the seminars. If there's people, if you're doing seminars and stuff like that, and you're teaching, how do people get in contact with you to maybe, you know, join in the seminars or, or you know, go and go and learn from you? How how can they contact you social media wise, or is there like a link somewhere? Um, can you get in touch with me? Um, I'm on uh, Twitter um, at Gary H Goodrich. I'm um, at Gary H. I'm on Twitter. I have about uh, I don't know 44 um, 44Ks, 44,000 friends, um, and this climbing. So you know, easy to get a hold of me at uh, at Gary H Goodrich. Very simple. I answer everybody. I talk to people all the time. I'm Twitter's what I'm on. As a matter of fact, I'm talking to you now, and I'm still on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I will put the I'll put the Twitter handle up on the. Uh, I'll put his link on for his Twitter account on the, on the description below uh, when you're listening to this, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and Gary, uh, before before you shoot off, like I, I will say it again, thank you for stepping in and doing what you did in the past. You know, thank you for the fights that you did. Thank you for what you've done with the sport and being part of it. 